When you think of Phyllis Hyman, the phrase, gone too soon, might come to mind. She was a beauty with a voice like no other. The future was looking so bright for her in the early 1980s. She was headlining a hit Broadway musical called Sophisticated Ladies. Her voice was being used in commercial jingles to sell everything. Credit for MasterCard, burgers for Burger King, Welch's grape juice, and hair coloring for Clairol. In addition to singing the Clairol jingle, Phyllis Hyman also had a lucrative endorsement deal with Clairol. And to top it all off, she was the rising star at Arista Records, in whom Clive Davis was heavily investing so that she could become the next big thing in the music industry. It was all going so well until one decision that Phyllis made turned everything bad and made room for the next leading lady at Arista. Let's get into it. If you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous celebrities from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now on to why you are here. In 1975, when Norman Connors was laying tracks for You Are My Starship, that beautiful song that was released in 1976, he was looking for a female vocalist for his album. He had heard about Phyllis Hyman, a virtual unknown at that time, who was working at a nightclub on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. One night after he saw Hyman perform, he offered her a spot as the female vocalist on his fourth album for Buddha Records. After the title song got airplay on jazz radio, You Are My Starship went certified gold, catapulting Phyllis Hyman's career to new heights, as well as Norman O'Connor's and Michael Henderson's. Michael Henderson was a composer on that track. R&B Radio wanted more of Norman Connors and Phyllis Hyman, so they got more. A remake of the stylistics Betcha by Golly Wow. And the duo scored once again on the R&B charts with it. Phyllis Hyman released her first album in 1977 on the Buddha Records label, the same label that released You Are My Starship. Shortly after Hyman released her first album, there was a bit of a financial shakeup and reorganization at Buddha Records. The debt that they were in caused a substantial decline in new releases. So, Arista Records stepped in to take over their distribution. This resulted in several other artists leaving their label and switching up to sign with Arista. Norman Connors and Phyllis Hyman were among those who signed with Arista. And there is no story told about Arista Records without mentioning Clive Davis. Clive had very big plans for Phyllis and Phyllis was not a fan of his plans. She felt that he was taking away the creative license that she had when she was signed to Buddha Records. Phyllis wanted to record soul-stirring songs that meant something to her, songs that she thought would mean something to other people. Clive Davis wanted a soulful voice on a pop tune that would sell a lot of units. Clive's vision for Phyllis was not Phyllis's vision for Phyllis. Needless to say, that made for a tense work environment, and that is putting it lightly. Still, in 1978, she managed to get out her first album, Somewhere in My Lifetime, for Arista. Barry Manilow produced her title track. He was a friend of hers and a fan of hers. The very next year, in 1979, she released her second album, You Know How to Love Me, it made it to the R&B Top 20 and performed well on the club and dance charts. Very near the time of this album release, Phyllis Hyman married her manager and music arranger, Larry Alexander. This mixture of business and pleasure didn't stay pleasant for too long. By 1982, the couple was divorced, their professional associations ended, and Phyllis Hyman started using cocaine a drug for which she developed a lifelong dependency. Thankfully for Phyllis, at least she had other ventures, like her Clairol endorsement deal.
Phyllis Hyman was one of the faces of Clairol's Born to be Beautiful hair color campaign. But when she decided to pose nude for We Magazine, that relationship with Clairol would also end in a professional divorce and make a way for the next singing starlet to catch Clive Davis's eye and become the focus of Eras to Records. Phyllis didn't like the feeling of being controlled by Clive Davis, even if there was a monetary benefit for following his instructions. Meanwhile, back at her label, Phyllis had a little bit of competition for the number one R&B spot from a woman who was more malleable and submissive to Clive Davis's will. That woman was Angela Bofill. But it's likely that neither Clive nor Angela were of any concern to Phyllis when she headed out to meet the wee photographer and interviewer for her appearance in the magazine in that life-changing summer of 1982. Phyllis Hyman, who had just in 1981 said that she hoped her image declared a morally righteous aspect, was getting ready to bear it all. She appeared in a seven-page spread that included an interview by Peter Wolf and photos by Oscar Abulafia. During the interview, Phyllis got to see the proofs from her shoot. She was shot in various stages of undress, exposing her breasts and or backside. There are pictures of her playing in a bubble bath, looking at herself in a full-length mirror, and slithering around on a bed of satin sheets. In the interview, she mentioned that she needed libational lubrication to get through the photo shoot. Sheila Eldridge, a top-notch PR agent, felt that all of the alcohol that Phyllis consumed during the shoot was tantamount to coercion, because apparently the plan was always that Phyllis was not going to go nude for that photo shoot. Sheila said that she believes everyone started drinking and that from there, they all just kind of got loose. Sheila got the call the next day, letting her know that Phyllis ended up going nude in the shoot. And to quote her recollection, her reaction was that she simply said, Oh no! Sheila must have known what was coming next because that photo shoot did Phyllis Hyman's career no favors. The executives at Clairol were furious. Sid Marr, who was Phyllis's manager at the time, said that he tried to talk her out of this decision, especially after he saw the photos. In the Wii interview, Phyllis even talked about one of her many endorsement companies wanting an all-American girl. That's what they all wanted. And that's what she gave them all until this photo shoot. At the time of this scandalous photo shoot, Phyllis had been a spokeswoman for Clairol for just over a year. Clairol had booked her to sing at some promotional events in July, but Clairol canceled her singing appearances on June 17th, just days after her nude photos were out. With this move, the repercussions were just starting to unfold. After the Wee Magazine came out, Clairol just squashed their contract with Phyllis. Because of the canceled event dates, Phyllis accused Clairol of anticipatory breach of contract, but word came back from Clairol that it was actually Phyllis who was in breach of contract. You see, Clairol had a morality clause in their contract of which Phyllis was unaware. Among many other things, one of the things prohibited under the morality clause was public nudity of any kind, and Phyllis definitely violated it by appearing nude in the magazine. But to further intensify the situation, Phyllis mentioned Clairol in the We interview, clearly something that the company would not want to be attached to. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, We sent images from the photo shoot to Jet Magazine without Phyllis's consent. It was just an implied nude that didn't show any of her private parts, but with the word already out, the image that they sent was more than enough. Jet Magazine published the photo and ran with this story seen here. The story was called, Phyllis Hyman Bears Her Beautiful Body, and it reads, When the statuesque song stylist Phyllis Hyman, star of Broadway's hit musical, Sophisticated Ladies, was propositioned to allow Wii magazine photographer Oscar Avalafia to shoot her for a nude photo layout in the June issue, she responded first with genuine shock, then laughter. Yet, she told Wii, 
She never dreamed she would even be asked. Three glasses of white wine later, she confessed that she always wanted to do it. It required a bit of libational lubrication to get through, Phyllis told We, who said the six foot one beauty frequently bemoaned to no one in particular, I can't believe I'm doing this. Readers of Jet, who remember the laments of sexy actress Jane Kennedy after her revealing photos in Playboy, probably won't believe it either. Phyllis's first concern about revealing her beautiful body was how her family, friends, and sophisticated ladies cast members would react. She was prepared to tell them what she told we. Look, I live by myself. What's a girl to do? A person in my position who lives the kind of life I lead has got to live in a fantasy world a lot of times. I've always had fantasies about wanting to look a certain way. So I take the girl's heads off, centerfolds in we, Playboy, and Penthouse magazines. I put my head there and I borrow their bodies in my fantasies. Phyllis shouldn't be surprised now if other women want to do the same thing with her body in we. As for her male admirers, they probably have other ideas about what to do with her body. Now those are the words of Jet Magazine. Back to the story. After those photos got out, the Clairol contract wasn't all that was squashed as a result of this interview and spread. As a result of the We Nude photo spread, Clive Davis stopped pouring his resources into Phyllis Hyman and washed his hands of her. It was at that point that Clive Davis went looking for Whitney Houston, and he found her. And that is how one mistake on Phyllis Hyman's part pushed her own self out of the door and made room for Whitney Houston to take her spot as the top lady at Arista Records. And I guess that you could say the rest is history. By the way, if you wanna hear how Clive Davis played a devious role in the downfall of Millie Vanilli, you can check it out here in my video called The Truth About Millie Vanilli and Master Manipulator Frank Farian. But back to our story. By April of the very next year, 1983, Clive Davis signed Whitney Houston to Arista Records and he poured everything that he had at his disposal into the talent who was younger and more submissive than Phyllis Hyman. Goddess of Love was Phyllis's final album released by Arista Records and it was done as haphazardly as Clive Davis could have done it. He insisted that her lead single would be Riding the Tiger. So it was, and it was the only single released from the album. The sales were not great at all. But that was likely not a big concern for Clive. Because in the same year as the release of this final project for Phyllis Hyman, Clive was already working on a huge debut album for Whitney Houston. As for Phyllis, she was basically left to figure things out at Arista as well as she could on her own until she was released from her contract in 1985. You want to know how little she thought of Goddess of Love? Listen to her say it in her own words in this old radio interview here. The question was, out of uh, all of the things that we recognize you for, uh, your musical contributions, what was your favorite? I don't have a favorite. Oh, such a good answer. <laughs> there are songs we can talk about that I did not like recording okay. or did I want if you want to do that let's do yeah, that yeah well I'm sorry that I recorded Riding the Tiger okay I'm sorry I recorded Goddess of Love oh, okay there's a bunch of <laughs> that's <laughs> the only time I mentioned uh, okay I don't really record nonsense songs uh. very well gimmick songs and those two were somewhat that and I didn't enjoy working on them and I hated it when they were played now they were played so very little uh -huh. that I never had had a problem with it. No, I really didn't. <laughs> so there you have it. As far as Clive was concerned, out with the old and in with the new. And here is a totally unrelated fun fact for free. In case you didn't know, Phyllis Hyman was a cousin of Earl Hyman, who a lot of us best know as the grandfather on The Cosby Show. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going and share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. 
and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.